Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Amongst the uh, range of news items we have for you this week is a uh, novel way of preparing paracetamol and ibuprofen, the paracetamol being more commonly known as acetaminophen. Explanations, or at least theoretical explanations, as to why the uh, Dutch are incredibly tall. Resurrection of ancient parasitic worms. Computer chips that are made using neurons are funded by the military. Or how we could make computers more efficient. And signals of organic matter from Mars. The timestamps for these and other news items can be found in the description box below. Let's start with the repurposing and development of drugs from other pathways. Being able to synthesize or at least partially synthesize a drug from a new method could, at least in theory, drastically improve our waste and recycling. That is because these are made using paper waste instead of oil. Crude oil, as surprised as you may be to learn, is used to create many products that find their way into things like medication and more. In this case, acetaminophen and ibuprofen are two of the most common drugs used throughout the world, and in fact they are generally considered to be essential drugs. The trick with this is that they found a way to take pine tree compounds that are generated as a waste product from making paper, and be able to turn these into a useful product. The compound in question is beta-pinene, and it's a derivative of turpentine, which, as a general rule, is not safe to drink by itself, despite what might be said on the internet. Beta-pinines and then turpentine itself can be used to create other useful chemicals, uh, things like beta blockers, asthma drugs, and more. This means that they are incredibly versatile. Unfortunately, since they are also a byproduct of petroleum fuel, and the distillation for that, they obviously have some negative effects for the environment. A uh, ideally sustainable, but in this case at least renewable source of them is a much better step in the right direction. This is where United Kingdom research comes into play. The researchers at the University of Bath were able to figure out that there is a certain series of steps that can be used to create, well, the necessary products using beta pinene, and at least for the purposes of this video, importantly, the commercially viable yields of the precursors. It's entirely reasonable to think that there would be a way to chemically convert it into what you're after eventually, but if you can't do it efficiently, effectively, and on scale, there is no benefit to it. And this is why it's at least a, a useful approach, as not only are we now using what is waste to create useful products, but we're also not having to worry about using fossil fuels to generate it. In a further news this week, we have research showing that education alone isn't enough to, well, at least get people educated enough not to go down the rabbit hole of crazy conspiracy theories. In other words, not to be anti-science. Although it is true that those countries with the, uh, the most effective education systems, largely speaking Nordic countries, are the least likely to be swayed by anti-science media, and are the most capable of understanding, interpreting, and at least being skeptical of the science, this isn't something that necessarily extrapolates out to the rest of the world. The COVID-19 has shown us that on a very large scale. The researchers have effectively found a real-world demonstration of the Dunning-Kruger effect. As they describe it, our research suggests that there may be a problem of overconfidence getting in the way of learning, because if people think they know a lot, they have minimal motivation to learn more. The people with more extreme anti-scientific attitudes might first need to learn about their relative ignorance on the issue before being taught specifics of established scientific knowledge. This is one of the reasons why approaches that have critical thinking as a core aspect are so much more effective than those that either involve rote learning, fail to impart the ability to think critically and independently, or worse yet, simply tell people that this is what you should think are more effective overall. Admittedly, it's not the only European news this week, with interesting developments around the Netherlands and theories as to why the Dutch are so tall, and Yes, the Dutch are unusually tall. 
the article is uh, somewhat old now, so take it as a recent discovery rather than anything necessarily that exciting. The average height for a Dutch male is just over 6 feet at 1.86 meters. Admittedly, we assume that this was written by an American given they failed to use the appropriate unit of measurement, with the article saying 1.86 centimeters, not 8.6 meters. 8.6 centimeters is below 1 inch. The average American, anyway, is still shorter, at 1.76 meters, or just over 5 foot 9. The article, despite his other shortcomings, does at least uh, provide some explanations that are accurate. The first is natural selection, and there is an interesting phenomena with the Netherlands at least, where there was a preference for breeding very tall people at one point. This was a phenomenon known as the Potsdam Giants, where a Prussian prince decided to have incredibly giant grenadiers, and proceeded to also encourage them very strongly to breed with the local population. There's also the whole point of, well, breeding in general. The Dutch have a lot of sex, and to be quite blunt about it, uh, the more sex you have, the more likely there are to be, well, children. They also happen to sleep a lot, and interestingly, consumption of cheese. And yeah, apparently cheese will contribute to you growing taller, but it's not all cheese. Apparently things like Gouda, Alkma, and Edom varieties will contribute, whereas the others not necessarily so. In related but more bizarre genetics news, we have a Maryland woman who apparently has at least 60 siblings. Yes. This is not a Catholic family, or rather, this is the result of a donor. And yes, the donor apparently had, well, donated regularly enough that they had managed to get 60 different mothers pregnant. And this was through a service, which is where things get interesting as to why they didn't identify that, for lack of better phrasingness, they were favouring one individual over others. The discovery comes from the use of a genetic service, so think of something like 23andMe. The discovery is entirely driven by the fact that they had no idea who their father was or if they had any relatives. This is one possible use for genetic services like this. Initially, once they turned 19, they ran the test and they found 13 relatives that were siblings. Then they found up to 60, and there are possibly even more again. All siblings age between 14 and 27 years of age. While not record setting, with the current record being 240 siblings through similar phenomena, it's still a significant number. In other news related to children, but particularly related to people overall and how men are to a certain extent, are losing out in the modern world, and this comes from the Washington Post, so it's uh, rather surprising to see that they're actually taking a more even keel to this sort of scenario. The article opens with the uh, line, men, especially young men, were getting weird, and then it goes on to talk about things like incels and, and more. Admittedly, some of this is just the usual nonsense, but some of it is actually based in a sound scenario. For example, the shift in men from having large goals and being more active in the world to fundamentally satisfying themselves by video games, pornography, and to a certain extent online communities. The article does, however, go down the uh, usual far-right nonsense of 4chan, Donald Trump, and so on, but it at least builds on this to some extent with relevant and realistic facts. Ironically, this is the same sort of thing said not that long ago by people like Jordan Peterson, so it would appear that his words are gaining mainstream momentum, even if something like the Washington Post does not want to admit it. The article goes on to issues around masculinity and the fact that students have no idea what is described as a good masculinity is versus what is often called toxic masculinity. And this is, well, to be quite blunt, a nonsense scenario in which masculinity, seemingly no matter how it's portrayed, is 
eventually segued into being toxic. Unfortunately, a lot of the article does contain what could be best described as the standard dismissal of many things and the exaggerated claims of what happened when they went to say something like Jordan Peterson's speech. The anecdotal story of an individual turning around and saying that Jordan Peterson had taught me how to live would honestly have been a better story or anecdote if they had included dragons providing that speech, but hey, you have to make it work somehow, and the grift in this case is, well, at least more productive than it has previously been, which is a small step in the right direction. The only real take on this that seems to be universally acceptable is that regarding Andrew Tate, and even that could be considered somewhat extreme, where, yeah, the guy's an asshole, but the way he's described here does raise more issues than it, well, answers. The article is quite long, and overall it does seem to have a odd bias against the right wing, claiming that many of the presentations are solely to the right wing, and those on the left are better but not present in the same way. It's almost the same argument that was made not that long ago, that places like YouTube will eventually make you a right winger no matter what happens. Ultimately, to no one's surprise, the article itself seems to be about 10 years out of date and trying to play catch up with what the right has been preaching for just as long, and not without reason. As they point out, politically, the left is losing males. Not just because academically they're failing, but professionally they're not there, socially they're not there. This then is having significant implications for the rest of society as men effectively drop out, and go their own way, although not in the way of MGTOW, or rather they're simply choosing to try and find their own solutions which are then pushed back on by the left. Shifting to far less controversial news, but certainly one that might give you some concerns, the resurrection of a 40,000 year old worm. The worm itself is something of a nematode or a parasite. It is, well, something not so easy to kill for most people, and if you deal with soil regularly, you may be aware of nematodes and the issue they create around continuously planting the same crops in the same location. But in this case, the resurrection is purely based around finding samples in Siberia, which seems like a good way to start a horror movie. The discovery itself is, well, not that amazing. It's interesting, but not amazing. The amazing element to this is that the nematode is able to effectively put itself into a state of suspended animation, called cryptobioses. These have, uh, well, historically had a record of about 40 years, and now that record is having been measured in millennia. They aren't the only species that can do it, tardigrades, nematodes, and rotifers are also capable of doing so, but this specific example is a record setter. Other than the capacity to put itself into suspended animation, the genetics, as they were studied for this particular example, have found that many of the genes it has overlap with modern species, but that the purpose they serve is to survive in harsh environmental conditions. Most commonly nematodes that you would be aware of, like the flatworm, C. elegans, is evolved to cope with temperate regions and dealing with things like uh, rotting biological matter. Others, for example, the one discovered, are in extremely cold conditions. Others, again, are for much more uh, geologically active environments. The implications for this aren't immediately useful. However, if we can figure out what's going on, it is possible, at least in theory, to uh, take the genes that are responsible for this stability and use it to make tissues and cells much more viable over the long term, especially if we're talking about research samples where you may have them in a very cold freezer for months, years, and as recently shown, decades, and you need them to be able to survive that long without the complications or mutations. In further microbiology news, we have bizarre viruses found in of all places, a Massachusetts forest. The virus itself looks kind of like a face hugger from aliens, and that's one of the reasons why it's been somewhat interesting for many people. 
The rather large virus in this case isn't one of the most giant viruses that exist as they're getting close to 2 micrometers, but it is still significant in size. The key thing here is not so much that we know anything about these viruses, but rather that we've found them, and the way they've been found is, well, the most basic of basic ways, quite literally going through with a microscope, at least in this case a scanning electron microscope, and visually identifying viruses. In uh, further news related to science, and arguably computers as well, it's the uh, funding of a uh, human brain cross computer chip. Yeah, this might sound uh, dystopian and unpleasant, but the research is based in sound reasoning, sort of. The Australian research is creating what they've called the dish brain. It's a semi-biological computer. The device, let's call it, it uses a combination of human and mouse neurons, roughly 800,000 of them, which also have electrodes attached. This lets you create a quasi-biological computer that can learn. In this case, it learned to play Pong in very short order, and it's kind of disturbing. The reason this has received attention, at least, is not so much that it's a biological computer, or quasi-computer, that is able to learn and develop, rather where the funding for it came from. The funding in this case was related to the Australian military in a weird kind of way, primarily related to the uh, nexus of biology, data, computers, and similar, uh, to allow it to create, or at least the government to fund creation of technology that would help to protect Australia. Again, the technology used in vo and involved is not necessarily new. For example, one of the uh, simple ways they were able to get it to learn how to play Pong related to uh, giving an electrical stimulation as a reward, and uh, unpredictable electrical stimulation as a sort of punishment. Right now, the technology is more like proof of concept or very early and rudimentary developments on the pathway to more significant work. That is because, theoretically, you could use it in production of, well, at this stage, machine learning, but in the future, if technology permits, AI or something similar. And that comes down to the frank fact that it has incredible learning capacity. You could use it for many different things, not just military applications, but for example, you could arguably use it in the exploration and the development of drugs without the need to actually have the drugs on hand. Not only that, but you could, again theoretically, be able to create and then copy a particular profile of knowledge using this system, meaning you could have incredibly powerful banks of these that are optimized to a specific purpose but have very low power or memory requirements but can produce extremely amazing results. In other computational news, we have an article from Neurologica and it's talking about how it is that we need to make and can make computing more efficient. The argument starts with the simple data that 10% of the world's electricity is used for computational purposes, whether that is, for example, the internet, your phone, a laptop, or something similar. Obviously, as we have more and more technology using electricity in the form of things like ChatGPT or other purposes, we're going to obviously have huge increases in the demand of electricity. And that means that one of the easiest ways, arguably, to make the human race more efficient and rely less on electricity is to make computing more efficient. The blog post goes through a, a series of developments that could be used to exactly this purpose. For example, logic gates. The logic gate example that they give is, well, the most generic one available today that is either able to conduct an electron or have an electron hole, which is where an electron should be but isn't. The ambipolar transistor is able to make logic gates work in both states at the same time, and therefore you would only need half as many of these at any given time for the tasks at hand, simply because it can achieve both jobs. There are a range of other developments that are described, 
Some are more significant or useful than others. Some are pragmatic answers to the problems of today, but not long-term solutions. Going to academic news and something of a interesting, bizarre, and also a dumb item from Retraction Watch. An author who published more than 500 letters to the editor in a given year. With there being 52 weeks in a year and allowing for minimum leave requirements of two weeks a year, this means the author wrote 10 letters to the editor every week. There isn't enough time in a day, let alone a year, for that to be possible. Yet, that is what Viroj Wiebenatic was able to do, with 543 letters to the editor published in 12 months. If we assume, just for the sake of argument, that this was either somebody having the article's ghost written for them, or that they literally had nothing better to do with their time during the lockdowns of COVID, then yeah, maybe. This is where things get a little more difficult though. The issue is the range and diversity of letters that were submitted, some being a mere single paragraph, others being more extensive. Beyond this, they also covered many topics. For example, COVID-19 and vaccinations, which may have relationships. But then there's monkeypox, knee replacement surgeries, bipolar disorder, and chat GPT. Yeah. Retraction Watch does have a relatively complete, and you can then go to the complete, email exchange they had with the author in question, and most of it seems, at least on the surface, to be justifiable and explicitly appropriate for an academic, but at the same time, it does raise a lot more questions than it answers. In other news, we have astronomical developments regarding NASA and the fact that they at least for a time lost contact with the ISS, the International Space Station. This is not something you want, as any time you hear Houston, we have a problem, it's going to end very badly if that problem does not get solved. At least, fortunately in this case, the loss of communication wasn't, wasn't due to issues with the ISS itself, or rather it was NASA's facilities on Earth, the Johnson Space Center, and this means that, although again temporary, the loss of communication for 20 minutes didn't end in any uh, unforeseen or particularly deleterious ways. The final news we have for you this week is the uh, discovery, or at least likely discovery, of organic molecules. That is an overstatement. It would be more accurate to say the signals that indicate organic molecules, so we are just a, a slight step back from actually having something organic there that could either have historically given rise to some sort of life, or in the very distant future, give rise to life. The importance of this finding is not the molecules themselves so much, as there have already been examples of them found in other locations, particularly the Gale Crater, but rather just how prevalent and widespread their presence is. This is the important distinction. Finding them in multiple places rather than just one means that Mars either could or did at some point have all the necessities for organic molecules. And this means that either going forwards, there may be life, or there may have been life previously. If there is a noteworthy difference between the locations that have been identified to contain organic molecules, it does mean that it is possible that either different asteroids that crash to the surface of Mars either carried their own organic molecules, and therefore it gives a better basis to the argument that life came from beyond Earth and in this case from beyond Mars, or it does mean that uh, different asteroids were delivering different kinds of molecules, and that these in turn will allow for different kinds of life to be generated in different locations and ideally different planets. If it's not that and we have the same organic molecules in the different locations, it's possible and arguably true that they were already present on Mars and exposed by the meteorite not just do we have uh, importance for that, but that each site shows signs of water having had a role in what's going on. This does indicate that there is more substance to moving water on Mars than was available previously, although 
moving water on Mars does seem to have been fairly well established and accepted across the astronomical community at this point. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.